Welcome to another episode of Taste of Magic. This episode, I'm going to be talking about the upcoming set, which is From the Vault Realms. Uh, From the Vault is a series where there's 15 cards, uh, all premium foil, and they all have a theme. This year's theme is lands. Uh, here's the promo art that they originally showed before they showed any of the of the lands. I originally thought that this was going to be a new art for the card uh, Thawing Glaciers, which is a really nice card where you can keep searching for more and more basic lands. Uh, but in actuality, it is Glacial Chasm. Uh, Glacial Chasm being a card from uh, Ice Age, and it prevents all the damage dealt to you. The original wording was it reduces all damage dealt to you by to zero, uh, which was a little bit more powerful. So damage that could not be prevented could be reduced to zero if you go by the wording. Um, interesting card, um, fun for certain combos. Uh, the next one that's been spoiled is Murmuring Bosk. This is one of the tribal lands from the Lorwyn block. Uh, this is the Tree Folk one, obviously, so you can you can play your Doran card. And interesting, you can tap it for three different colors, one for free, uh, white and black. It does one damage to you. Next is the Grove of the Burn Willows. This one has new art. Uh, this is one of five cards from Future Sight, where they were all, you could tap for two colors, and they had some other kind of mechanic as a teaser for, these are, these are land cycles we might, we might do someday. This is kind of the opposite of the pain lands, where instead of doing one damage to you for tapping uh, for a color, other, your opponents gain one life, so it's interesting. Another Future Sight card, which is the Dryad Arbor. It's a creature and a land at the same time. The first and last of its kind so far. Um, it doesn't have haste, so you can't tap it for mana right away. The next one is Forbidden Orchard, which got played a lot in Oath of Druids decks. This is a new artwork. Um, for the Forbidden Arch Orchard, uh, and kind of an interesting card. You can, I don't think it's used for its original intention, which was uh, tap it for one color of any any mana, but your opponent gets a creature, and people started using those creatures as um, a way to punish your opponents, whereas it's supposed to be a punishment for you. Um, Urborg, Tomb of Yagmoth, uh, another really cool card. Makes all land swamps in addition to their other types. And just an interesting card. Uh, you can do a lot of different things with it. Get some swamp walk creatures or um, get out your cabal coffers. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can go with it. Uh, next one is uh, Boseju. Who shelters all, which makes um, sorceries and instants uncounterable. And finally, the last one that we've seen spoiled so far is Vesuva. Uh, Vesuva being a reference to the Vesuvan doppelganger. And Vesuva comes into play, and it's a copy of Target Land, which this is a cool card for a lot of casual formats. It's great in Commander. Because you know your your commander opponents are going to be playing some powerful lands. Another way you can use it is you can copy your cloud post and get out some glimmer posts and tap for insane amounts of land. So those are the cards that have been spoiled so far. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the top 10 most expensive lands that potentially could be in this set. Uh, I am not going to include the original dual lands from beta because I'm pretty certain that they're not going to reprint any of these. This was, These were the 10 dual lands and they are all very expensive. But coming in at number 10 for most expensive land ever printed is 
brand new Cavern of Souls. A uh, very powerful land. You can choose a creature type, and you can make that creature type uncounterable and get mana for any color as long as you're casting that creature type. And it doesn't come into play tapped. Very powerful land. It's pretty awesome. Um, very expensive. Uh, next is City of Traders. Kind of an interesting card from Exodus. Uh, you can tap it for two colorless land, but as soon as you play another land, you have to sacrifice it. Uh, another land that saw another lots of lots of tournament play, which is Radish Import. This is coming in at number eight. Was well, the most expensive card. And it can tap lands. Number seven is from Arabian Nights. It's Elephant Graveyard. Uh, not super useful, but you can tap it for colorless mana, and you can regenerate elephants and mammoths. So if you really want to make your elephant or mammoth deck, this could be useful. Uh, number six is the Mutavault. It's a changeling land, and it's a very cheap man land. You only have to pay one colorless to turn it into a 2-2 to the end of turn. And it is all creature types, um, so you can use your Elephant Graveyard to regenerate it. Uh, number five is the Island of Wok Wok, uh, which is just pure flying creature hate. It reduces target flying creatures' power to zero, uh, but you can't tap it for mana. Another land from Arabian Nights, which some of these lands might just be expensive because they're so old. Coming in at number four is an entire cycle. It's the fetch lands from Onslaught. There was five of these, one for each friendly color combination, um, and they're very powerful because they bring into the new the new land comes into play untapped, which is very useful. Uh, you don't lose a turn, and these saw a lot of tournament play, and they're still used today. I would wonder if they're going to be reprinted so they can be used in modern format. Uh, I would not be surprised if you see them in Return to Ravnica, possibly. At number three, we have um, Mishra's Factory, which is the original Man Land. This one, also you tap one mana to get a 2-2. Two -two. This is the artifact instead of me and all creatures. For some reason, the winter scene is the most expensive one. I don't know why, but there were four of them, one for each season. Um, these are from Antiquities, another really old set. Uh, number two, we have Diamond Valley, another card from uh, Arabian Nights. So again, it might just be because it's old, but this one's actually kind of useful because you can tap and sacrifice a creature to gain life. Uh, useful in the late game um, if you just need a couple more extra life. And the number one most expensive card that is not a dual land is Mishra's Workshop. Uh, Mishra's Workshop being you can tap it for three mana, but it can only use, be used to cast artifacts. Uh, very powerful, useful in legacy decks if you're playing a lot of artifacts. And just a cool land, but very, very expensive if you want to buy one. So... Those are the top 10 most expensive land cards. Uh, in addition, let me show you some of my picks for for what would be a cool card if they put in. Let's see. Uh, I think Glimmer Void would be really cool just because the artwork would be amazing uh, with the, the special foiling. Another card I'd like a lot is Lotus Veil. It's a great casual card. I don't know if it's really a, a tournament card, but it's a lot of fun and Casual people love this card. I, I like it a lot. Uh, Reflecting Pool. It did get reprinted in Lorwyn Block, so I don't know if we'll see that again. Uh, a lot of people are asking for Karakas, which is banned in Commander format. Um, and then, last of all, there's going to be a... There will probably be a land that is a preview card for Return to Ravnica. So possibly something like the Pillar of the Pelrums. It'll be a new card. It won't be this. But it, it'll be like a multicolored card. You can top it for different colors of mana for multicolored spells, I think. So 
All right, see you next time for a taste of magic.